Uh, welcome to the agriculture and aquaculture panel. Uh, if you're looking for the business one, uh, please review the Grenadine link to get you in the right place. Uh, that, uh, I'm Thaddeus Waterman. I'm CCL's Maryland State Coordinator. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be serving as a moderator for this session. Our goal of this panel is to obtain a better understanding of how we can work with and amongst these two communities to address climate change. We have set aside about 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A but we may field relevant questions throughout our discussion. So please direct any questions you may have for our panelists to our please chat or ask me Q&A person. We also, if you have any technical issues, please direct them towards our ask me help using the chat function. We have four great panelists with us today. Uh, they're going to be spotlighted um, and we'll be giving them a chance to introduce themselves. Tim, would you like to start off with a short introduction about yourself? Sure. I'm Tim Rosen. I'm the Director of Agriculture and Restoration for Shore Rivers. Uh, we're located on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, but we work throughout the Delmarva Peninsula at the heart of our organization. We're a riverkeeper organization, um, but within my department, Ag and Restoration, we work directly with the ag community in order to achieve both water quality, uh, agronomic, and resiliency goals. Thanks, Tim. Uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, my name is John Knox. I'm an organic farmer in Somerset County, New Jersey. And um, our farm is a uh, direct uh, to consumer uh, retail farm. So we have a farm market on the property and we um, also do local farmers markets. And since uh, COVID started back in March, we started a home delivery business that is quite busy and becoming a growing part of our business as well. Um, but we do um, vegetable production on the property and we raise uh, pigs and chickens on, on the farm as well. And, um, you know, as well as that, um, the president of our local county board of agriculture. Um, so, you know, somewhat involved with that and, um, you know, certainly concerned about the climate around us and see impacts of it every day. So it keeps me pretty close to this issue and, uh, yeah. Um, Thanks, John. Drew, would you like to introduce yourself and let us know what you do? Hi, I'm Drew Winters. I'm the policy director for the American Fishery Society, um, which is an organization of about 8,000 fishery scientists and natural resource professionals across the globe. We're primarily centered in the U.S. Our headquarters is in Bethesda. Um, what we generally do is have um, scientific publications, books, and a scientific conference, but I happen to do our government affairs. So I work with coalitions of conservation organizations and sportsmen's group as we promote the use of best available science and policymaking. We've got a real focus over the last couple of years on helping to change the dialogue on climate change in Washington um, and amongst uh, constituents who can help influence uh, federal policymaking on this issue. We we also support um, a, a environmentally sound marine aquaculture, a stable regulatory environment for that as a solution um, to help with some of the changes we're seeing to fish and fisheries in the face of climate change. So thanks for having me today. Thanks. Thanks, Drew. And uh, Keith, would you like to let us know what you do? Yes, my name is Keith Olinger. I'm a farmer in Hard County, Maryland, originally born and raised in Pennsylvania. Um, I've served on over 20 different committees and councils and task force and commissions, including the Maryland Ag Commission and Farm Bureau, the Howard Soil Conservation District, Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts. On our farm, we practice what's now considered regenerative agriculture. We have livestock and trees, uh, honeybees and orchard. Um, we do a lot of composting. And so uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, thank you everyone for those quick introductions and to get started. Uh, to give our audience a little bit of a background, I'd first like to start with a discussion on why is it important to the agriculture and aquaculture communities that we address climate change. Uh, would anyone like to get started on that topic? You know, I'll go. Uh, I'll just say it's survival of our species. Um, we 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 need to we need to eat. We need to live, and we need a planet that's going to function in the future for our children and, and those who come behind us. So, um, it's it's a challenge.
Yeah, feel free to jump in, uh, Drew, whenever. Yeah, oh, great, I'll do it. Um, so um, fishery scientists see climate change as an existential threat to fish and fisheries. Um, we are already see seeing changes in both freshwater and marine environments to fish and fisheries. Um, and so these changes in precipitation, increased temperatures, ocean acidification, um, and other impacts from climate change are really threatening the survival of fish. So in freshwater fish, 65% uh, of freshwater fish are already threatened um, by things like pollution, habitat loss, and, and other factors. Coupled with climate change, um, we're going to see a lot of species going extinct if we don't address the climate, uh, the issues around climate change, including reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and providing mitigation and adaptation solutions. Um, and so we're really interested in working in coalition to help change again, change the dialogue. And, and so that's why AFS is really involved in this. Yeah, I, mean, I would say that uh, this is a, it's a big issue for me. A lot of things that I'm seeing are, uh, you know, growing vegetables. Um, they really love consistent weather, consistent precipitation, uh, massive temperature swings, early frosts, late frosts. Uh, don't help me on either end of my season. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a concern for for the longevity of. Uh, people eating on this this planet um you know i think the big concern uh for agriculture and climate change needs to be snow packs uh you know the, the amount of uh, it's not an issue in new jersey but i knew from farming in colorado and i know that uh you know the Himalayan snow pack is about two million people so i think it's something we need to be seriously concerned about because everything we eat needs water so it's apparently I don't know if I have much more to add than what the other panelists have already covered. Um, I mean, it's really about long-term resilience and planning for the future. You know, if, if we work on the Delmarva Peninsula, so if we can't have a productive agricultural system here, our next land use is development. Um, and that's happening in Sussex County, Delaware um, on a large scale. And that's where our you know, land is very profitable around here. So within what we're trying to do is make sure that these farmers are able to keep farming so that we don't have to go to the alternative of developing this land in order to make sure that they have profit and can keep um, their families going. So it's kind of a dual edged sword there that farm resiliency allows for better conservation because the alternative is, is development. Those are all uh, really good points. Um, do you guys have any idea what the biggest hurdles in agriculture and aquaculture uh, in these communities are towards addressing climate change or any opinions on that? Oh um, my, I, I would say it's trust. The, the, the challenge is that, that these relationships have been damaged so many times and it seems like everybody's always at odds with each other. And so it's really, we really need to work together. Um, I liked what a lot of the previous panel was, was talking about um, before we came on here, but you know, that, that's the challenge. How do you, how do you build trust where there isn't any, or how do you repair trust where it's been damaged? And, and then you got to work together to move forward. And the, the, the other, the other issue is, is that we're, we're on a time crunch here. So it takes time to build trust. It takes time to build those relationships, but we don't necessarily have all the time that we need to do that. So it really makes it a hard environment to try and get stuff done. I think, um, you know, similar, you know, what Keith's saying, as far as the time crunch, I, I feel like, you know, all farmers feel like every season is, is a time crunch to like make it all happen, make your crops come through and you're dealing with, you know, on a annual basis, you're dealing with major droughts or early frost or something like that. And then to try to take back and say, you know, how can I change my practices to help the long-term viability of, of the planet? You know, it's, it's hard to take that step back and make realistic changes in and how you function um, to have a viable impact on, on improving the environment. You know, when you're trying to survive and you're trying to get from one day to the next and try to, you know, keep your business viable. Um, but I, I do think it's it's an important conversation that, that farmers need to have. Um, but it's it's certainly a challenging one, you know. Tim or Drew, would you like to weigh in on the issue? 
So I think maybe I can weigh in on a, a way to bridge that gap or at least share with you what AFS is doing to help change the narrative and build bridges across various communities. Um, so particularly in the scientific community, the scientists have been on board with climate change for a long time, but they haven't been well understood by various communities. So what AFS is focusing on is helping our scientists learn to communicate with, with non-scientific audiences to help connect with them where they are. So rather than coming at them at odds, connecting with them on shared values, um, talking about the impacts to fish and fisheries and connecting that to things like water quality, drinking water, things that affect everybody, um, love for the outdoors, you know, particularly in the time of a pandemic when lots of people have been focusing on the outdoors, helping people to understand how um, outdoor recreation and nature is changing around us due to climate change. Um, and really, really meeting people where they have shared values rather than coming at them um, from a place of opposition. And we hope by targeting hunting and angler groups who have traditionally been strong conservationists and are great um, for political advocacy to help shift the dialogue there um, and take this opportunity while we have it in DC with um, a, a Congress that's largely controlled by the Democrats and a White House that's controlled by a Democrat to help shape this narrative a little bit. I guess discussing from the ag side, one of the, the largest hurdles is that we always seem to have a lot of new solutions to these resiliency issues um, and when we actually try to put them in the field practically, it doesn't always work out. I think Keith and John know this firsthand. Um, we have this tremendous push on soil health, which is a wonderful thing. You know, you need to have good soil to grow a good crop or, or raise good livestock. But when you take what we are telling these farmers to do and actually try to put it in practice within the operation that already spent millions of dollars to, to work in a certain way, you're asking for a tremendous change that generally is not economically viable. Um, and it's gonna be a slow change. It's not gonna be quick because if it fails one time, generally that farmer is not gonna go back and try it again because it's an economic burden um, and can sometimes sink their business because they are- you know, Sometimes you can't recover, you know. So. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the, the things that I've learned because I have a boot in both worlds, both in the environmental wor world as a, a river keep organization and then in the ag world doing ag and restoration and working with the farmers on the Del Marva. So it's it's a very interesting problem. Obviously there problem. is solutions Obviously though. There. Thanks. Hey John, we're getting a little bit of feedback from yours, I think. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, I know uh, Drew, you were talking about some of the solutions. Did you have a big hurdle that you wanted to discuss real quick? Like the biggest hurdle for agri aquaculture? Um, so, you know, in terms of marine aquaculture, there are some outdated misperceptions about the environmental impact of marine aquaculture. We really see it as an opportunity to um, have a reliable food source in the face of climate change. So wild marine catches are expected to decline in almost all parts of the U.S. So we see marine aquaculture as an opportunity to provide a more reliable food supply. But there are still a lot of groups, a lot of um, groups that support climate change action that have traditionally been very concerned about the environmental footprint of marine aquaculture. So that is definitely a hurdle to uh, marine aquaculture being one of the food security solutions on climate change. And we've been working to change those perceptions as well, both on the Hill and in the environmental community. Thanks, Drew. Really appreciate that insight on that. Um, so Chris, do we have any relevant questions from the audience that we could have to bring our panelists real quick? To Sorry, I, <laughs> I've been uh, I've been getting some questions for that I'm trying to direct over to our tech uh, person, but we'll come back to that if you're not ready. That's okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. So let's, uh, let's read. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so as we've been talking about the kind of the big hurdles, uh, the next thing we want to kind of get into is some of the uh, the solutions or the negative experiences have not negative but difficult experiences. Um, so I guess I want to ask all the panelists. Have you had any difficult experiences working with groups in the past that we can learn from or any successes that we can try to repeat in the future? And feel free to share a story. I know, Drew, you talked about this a little bit. Is there anything you wanted to add to your story to start us off? 
Um, so, you know, generally we, we work in a coalition. I think, um, you know, there are traditionally, there have been, you know, let's talk about scientists engaging on climate change, right? Nobody ever understands scientists. I'm not a scientist. I'm a lawyer by training and a government affairs professional, right? I sometimes can't even translate the scientist and I know generally what they're talking about. So for us, that's been this really huge hurdle to talking to people. Plus, right, there's this divide between generally scientists who lean more left and conservative organizations or conservative people, right? So, so them not understanding how to communicate well with, with non-scientists and not knowing um, you know, necessarily how to meet people where they are, that's been a huge challenge. So um, one of the things that we've done again is to develop a science communication training program to help our scientists speak without jargon and without technical terms and really meet people where they are. And that's how we're really hoping to bridge that divide. And so we can work um, more to um, get, get more people to understand how climate change will impact them and to be advocates for change in this short window of time that we feel like we have to act. You know, uh, Keith, would you like to comment on uh, either a difficult experience you've had or success you've had working with groups on the past? Uh, sure, we've, the, the big challenge that we had uh, for about a five year span and we lost was um, we had, you know, historically in the past, so not necessarily the last hundred years, but things would flow from the farm to the, to the community and then back to the farm. And so there's, um, a lot of history in composting and, and using wood mulches and that sort of thing. And we, we saw there was a potential problem coming across the country. So in our county, we tried to address it through our agricultural preservation easements and our zoning to make sure that there was language in allowing us to compost and wood mulch on our farms. It passed, but the first farmers that tried to do it, um, the community attacked them. They said they were gonna pollute the water and pollute the air and dust and noise and that big trucks were going to run over their children while they waited for school, school excuse me <coughs> for school in the morning and um even though we tried to explain that you know everything we were doing was safe and and we were going to follow the maryland department of environment guidelines we were all going to be be you know in their system and get inspected it didn't work and so now everything just goes to the landfill. Um, so, you know, that was a, that was a failure. And um, unfortunately they used a lot of social media and very, you know, I guess I'd say effectively, even though they were spreading misinformation, the challenge was I don't have time to sit on social media for 10 hours a day, arguing with people and trying to get them the facts. And we didn't have money to be able to hire somebody to do that. We didn't have public relations firms to deal with it or anything like that. So, so it just, we did hire some scientists to come out and talk, you know, they, they get, they did the investigations, they did the data. It wasn't effective. It didn't change anybody's mind. Um, on the, on the positive side, you know, they're, they're kind of just what, what we've parroted back before from the previous session in the places where we have been able to make those connections and there is trust we can work together, um, we can get things done. It's just a lot of times we're on the other side where it didn't work out so well versus the, the positive ones. I could just uh, re relate Keith on a, uh, a mulching and compost related thing where you're running the townships and uh, municipal ordinances, but uh, we, do, we try to do a lot of uh, working with local municipalities to receive uh, leaves from the, the yards and everything. And, you know, some are better than others as far as what trash is in them. And that's, yeah. that's a whole other problem. Yeah. But uh, the way the uh, legislation was written is that farms could receive the leaves, but then couldn't store them on their property um, for more than 90 days. And it was just a big disconnect between how it's going to work and actually using these you know leaves which are a great uh you know source of uh you know carbon for the soil and, and great organic matter and it's certainly better than putting them in the landfill and putting them in the soil 
but uh, you know, the, the leaves fall off the trees in, in you know, October, November. And then they're saying that the only time we have to spread these leaves on our fields is, is January. And, and really they're better when they break down a little bit and we'd rather right. use them in the spring. And it was just sort of training the uh, local municipality that like, look, this is something really good that we could use these municipal leaves in a composting program on a farm and, and spreading them. But you got to work with us and can't make us try and get them all out, out of the out of the farm in, in 90 days. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, let me let me stockpile my browns and then I can use them as I get my greens, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, that's that's a sort of a, a local example. But when you when you educate, you know, people and, and local municipalities, sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. But that in that case, it was a, a lot of farmers signed on to it and everybody pushed on them and, and it did go through and, and they did they did change that which was oh great good good news good news yeah tim did you have a story you'd like to share at all about either success or a difficult experience um i don't know just reflecting on what everyone else has said is i think the the biggest thing that always comes about when you think about um success or some hurdles or some negative outcomes is that generally it's just a disconnect between the two various groups that are trying to work together. Um, if you're in the environmental and policy side, you're creating these structures that don't necessarily work within the operation on the farm side. And you don't really think about how enacting these things, like John was saying, um, doesn't actually fit within what they're trying to do. And it doesn't make it effective at the, any kind of positive outcome in the end. Um, so that's one of the biggest things that that I always find is, you know, we're trying to take this this legislation or these new ideas um, that sound great, but then when you're in the field and you're trying to actually implement them at a scale for a, a positive impact, it doesn't really work out in the end. Um, and that and that comes back. I mean, one of the the things that we've been working on is obviously soil health. Um, it's a huge push throughout the country. We see it as a way of sequestering carbon, um, and you know, helping with climate change, but a lot of these different practices look great on paper and look great in you know, nice academic fields that are nice and clean. And you have one researcher that has plenty of time to actually implement this stuff. But when you go to a farmer who's, you know, has barley, cucumbers, soybeans, and corn trying to rotate through his fields, it's not the same kind of operation. And each of those fields needs a different kind of practice to achieve that soil health outcome. Well, he has 2000 acres to worry about. He can't figure that out on all those acreage. So that's kind of the, the, the negative, I guess, negative story or negative outcomes is just understanding that from taking it from the academic world and put it into the practical world, there's a lot of disconnect that can, can happen there. Not saying that it shouldn't stop us from trying to achieve these things. It's understanding what pieces need to be in place then to make it actually work out. Um, and that's where it's important to talk with the farm community about this stuff, because it could be a thing where you're saying you, you want to plant early cover crops. Well, do they have the tools to actually do that? And what's the expense for those tools to actually do that and make it practical on scale? I know in Maryland, we don't have enough tools to do that. We can't, we don't have enough aerial operators. We don't have a high boy cedar. You know, we have a great cover crop program. I'm not complaining about the funding on that end of it. But when you're trying to put cover crops in in August, and you're trying to fight back a, a you know fungal in your soybean fields while those aerial operators are spraying fields for fungicides, not putting down seeds. So there is that sort of disconnect between implementation of these practices and the actual practical scale of it. And Tim, we had a success, you and I, with the state committee when we worked with those smart drain tiles. I don't know if we want to get all the way in the weeds, but you can we can talk a little bit about with the with the folks about it if they want. So. Yeah, I don't know when Thad wants us to talk about success stories. <laughs> I just have, have one relating with the cover crops as you're bringing it up. But the, the biggest thing hurting me and, and cover crops right now is the, the non-migratory Canadian geese that we have. So we have this population, and I'm not sure if they have the same problem in, in Maryland, but we have Canadian geese that were introduced to New Jersey for some reason, experiment, uh, and they don't migrate and they just stay in New Jersey. And uh, man, they they love uh, Austrian winter peas and winter rye, and they just chow it up. And and uh, yeah, with vegetables, as far as getting in very early cover 
crop. We try to get things planted by the first week of October. And uh, beginning of November, I had a really nice stand of uh, peas and rye and, and triticale uh, over all our vegetable fields. And uh, it's been food for the geese for a long time, and it's not doing what it should be as far as soil health. You know, it's been very frustrating, but that's one of those, you know, invasive species <laughs> introduced. And yeah. Uh, well, and, and John, migratory. John, you probably with the Food Safety Modernization Act, and if they're if they're not leaving and migrating, then you got to deal with them in a year round situation. And, you know, then if you try to if you try to deal with them, then you have to be careful how you deal with them or you get, you know, get some of the organizations upset with you about what you're doing with the geese, you know, so that's a that's yeah. a tough situation. There's there's a lot of tough things about, about geese, but yeah, personally, you don't want them on your fields when you have uh, fresh greens going, right? So yeah, um, we're not, not a big fan of the geese uh, or the deer, but there's a re responsible ways of dealing with them, you know? Right. Right. Did you have anything you wanted to add before we move on to some success stories? You know, I just thought this was a great segue into talking about how to communicate with policymakers on some of these solutions and the value in really this coordination and telling stories. So, um, you know, a lot of the solutions that we're gonna be proposing for um, fish and aquatic health are related to agriculture, right? Some of the farm bill programs that are in place, we're talking about scaling up. It is gonna be really important to understand where um, and how those programs need to be tweaked or what some of the challenges are. And not just for this program, but all of our members in the audience, that value in telling a real story and on the ground story, it, it resonates throughout this work to change the narrative on climate change, right? It's really important instead of just signing on to a form letter or going on and clicking on some box on the internet that you submit to your uh, member of Congress to really talk about how climate change is impacting you and your community, to talk about your experiences specifically if you're a farmer, right, on the things that you're seeing and the challenges on some of these farm bill programs that yes, you support climate change because I think it's really important for the agricultural community to really be involved in letting their members of Congress know that they support climate change, particularly because this has been a more conservative group of people who doesn't always um, buy into the need to do something about climate change has sometimes been on the opposite side of this. So there's a real value in getting involved in a deeper level and sharing that story of how climate change is impacting you or helping to influence policy in a more concrete way. So I really encourage the members of this group um, to get involved in that way and, and to, to build that narrative around why they're so passionate passionate about climate change based on their own personal experiences. Uh, thanks, Drew. Uh, anyone have any comments on that from the ag community uh, about successes having done so or anything like that? Well, what I, what I would share is along the lines of what I was just mentioned about with Tim. So when we first moved here to Howard County, we bought the farm in 2012, we actually moved the operation in early 2013. I knew no one. Um, but by, you know, after about two years in with working with everybody, being active, especially as a regenerative farmer with, you know, people looked at you like you had three heads and the different stuff you were trying to do. I was able to build that trust with the, with the neighbors, with the folks, with the people in the community. They elected me onto the the board of supervisors for the soil conservation district and the board of directors for the local farm bureau and a bunch of other different organizations. And when once I, I established that trust and I was able to work with them and they knew I wasn't trying to hurt them, they could, we could then have the broader conversations. And so one of the things was once I got appointed onto the ag commission, I was their representative the state soil conservation committee. Tim had come, uh, you know, and you can talk about your side of it there, Tim, with these these smart drains and essentially the, the thinking up to that point with the state was that, you know, we're dealing with water quality. We're going to help with what's outside the monetary profit making center of the farm and try and protect that water quality. So they would pay for stuff up to that point. But then from there in, they wouldn't pay. And that was up to the farmer well, this is benefiting the community. It's benefiting water quality. It's helping overall the environment and fisheries and everything involved. 
but it's very expensive to do. And there's no, there's no profit differential. I'm not getting added money for crops grown inside a field that's, that's treated with drains versus ones that aren't. So there has to be bridging that gap. But I served on the committee that had to approve it. And so when Tim came and started doing things, well, one, I already had the trust of the folks behind me that were listening to me. And so when I said, hey, listen, what, what we're talking about here, let's move forward, let's get it done. You know, it, it was more likely to be accepted because they trusted me. And then, you know, I, I was I was in a favorable position. I knew what Tim was trying to do. So I don't know if you want to mention that, Tim, or talk about your side of it. Yeah, I can I can briefly try to briefly talk about it. Um, usually I'm talking about this for about an hour, hours on end. But, <laughs> sure, right. um, um, what Keith is mentioning is a set of practices that fall under the, the term of conservation drainage. Um, and for those of you who don't really understand a farm field, you can either drain a, a farm using ditches or subsurface drainage tile, which is this perforated pipe that goes about three feet below the top of the, the field um, and, and lowers the water table. Now, obviously, there are positive agronomic outcomes with that because, um, you know, you only get agricultural soil health if you have an aerated root zone, you know, you, the only, the only agronomic crop, crop I could think of that likes to have wet feed is rice and we don't grow rice around here. Um, so in order to get agricultural soil health, we've drained a lot of our landscape to grow these crops. And we have a tremendous drainage network in Maryland. It's one of the oldest in North America. I think Maryland was a state in 1788 and we did our first tax ditch in 1789. That's how important drainage is for the state of Maryland. Um, but obviously drainage is kind of turned into a dirty word because it has negative water quality outcomes and it has, it destroys wetlands and everything else. But as we look towards long-term resiliency of these farms, a farmer needs drainage and they're going to do drainage with or without conservation as a part of it. So we started this discussion of how can we partner with farmers to, to help improve their drainage to have long-term resiliency for growing that crop while also achieving our water quality outcomes. And that's what Keith was mentioning there is this was 2018, I think. Yeah, I think so. We started talking about this. Um, and we came to a discussion point of, we have these wonderful practices that we can do with drainage tile, um, but we're not cost sharing on the part that the farmer wants, which is actually the tile lines, that, that perforated pipe to help drain the field. So how could we create a system where they can get a, a little bit of funding for the drainage while we also get our, our conservation practices put in. And we were able to come to uh, a, a great outcome of creating this, this framework through Maryland's Maryland Agricultural Water, Water Quality Cost Share Program. Uh, that acronym is MAX. Um, so it's within the MAX funding portfolio for the state of Maryland. Um, so you can sign up for conservation drainage practice um, to, to replace your old drainage system and do it in a way that also has positive water quality outcomes, so. And it, it just wouldn't have been possible without all the good work that Tim and his organization has been doing behind the scenes and that I was doing and others like me, you know, in order to get it passed. So it was, it was, it was a good, good thing. Yeah. And that's, that was working directly with the soil conservation districts. Um, if you're, if you're looking to start working in the farm community, the first place to go is your local districts and start a relationship with the staff in there because they know the farm community already, they're trusted, um, and they'll tell you if you have a bad idea. They'll, they'll blatantly say, this is not gonna work here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I could relate a, a similar story that, that uh, happened with me, um, just in, you know, in those motivations for, for farmers to change practices, but uh, working with the NRCS, um, uh, here in New Jersey, I, I did their uh, high tunnel program. It was a very popular program for far vegetable farmers. And, uh, you know, basically, you know, fill, fill out all the paperwork and you get a fully reimbursed, uh, you know, high tunnel uh, that you can grow vegetables in pretty much year round. Uh, great program, but to be qualified for it, you know, you have to do a, uh, a whole, you know, kind of a soil audit and practices audit on your whole farm and just make sure all your practices are, are in line with what the NRCS is doing to prevent uh, soil erosion, you know, and I wasn't concerned about the inspection. I was like, yeah, hey, we do, you know, great cover cropping program and mulching and we don't leave a lot of bare soil and, you know, not too intensive with cultivation and things like that. But 
you know, after the whole review, uh, they just pointed out the the ways we had our beds running in one of the one of our fields that we were using. They said, you know, like could do a lot for changing your soil erosion on this farm by turning this, you know, your your bed structure uh, at a, a ninety degrees. And you know, I, I had no problem implementing that, and I certainly had no problem implementing that if it was the difference of getting a free high tunnel. Um, so I think those are great motivators for farmers, but also it's an educational opportunity to have somebody from the state come out and kind of walk through and say, hey, this is something you could be doing better um, to reduce soil erosion. So um, I think that's that's true of, you know, what Tim's saying is that, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll help you drain your fields, but you need to adopt some new practices, you know, and I think there could be, you know, down the road, some some great things of, hey, you know, you could uh, reduce your your carbon uh, output from your farm by doing these different things or, you know, so I think farmers are definitely motivated by programs to uh, help improve their farm and their business viability uh, while at the same time eager to adopt some changes, you know, if, if that's the, the difference, you know. So we've talked a lot about like past experiences and the motivations behind the community. Uh, looking forward, is there any ways another organization could help you achieve your climate related goals? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go. I, I think one of the things they mentioned in that previous panel was just don't make assumptions. You know, um, when listen, when, when the other folks are talking, try and try and understand things truly from their perspective. You know, John, John was talking about it, you know, it, it, and I had mentioned it earlier, you know, a lot of this is, is, is economic, you know, and if, if John had had certain buildings in position already and stuff, and it wouldn't have been easy to, to, to turn them 90 degrees. Well, you know, it's not that he's trying to be mean or anything or, or destroy the environment, but it may not be feasible for him to do that. Or like, like Tim was mentioning about, you know, some of this stuff, if it's extremely expensive, it's not that the farmer doesn't want to do it. It's just to be able to get it to work and, and, and survive till the next year. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's getting that communication and trying to, trying to just listen and actually hear what they're saying, not just be worried about what you're going to say next, you know, so. Do you want to like to add? Uh, I could do uh, some questions from the audience now, if that's uh, if that works. Yeah. Do we have? Uh, well, I want to finish out um, to make sure everyone's heard. Uh, Drew, is there anything another organization could help you with for uh, in the future to help address your goals? Um, you know, so for us, we're really looking towards hunters and anglers. Um, and I think that provides just a tremendous opportunity to focus on shared values and motivate a constituency that is already very politically active, working on a lot of the programs that we think are going to be crucial to resilience for fish and aquatic systems in the face of climate change. So for us, I mean, I'm really encouraging our scientists to go out and talk to them. But again, just like Keith said, um, it's meeting people where they are. It's understanding that people are really afraid of what what, what solving climate change means to them economically. Um, and I think if we come at this um, at shared values, rather than being really at loggerheads with people, if coming to it, you know, I'm on the right, you're on the left, and there's no meeting in the middle. I mean, I think if we come back to this idea of we're all Americans, we all want what's best for our neighbor. Um, we want what's best for our family's economic health as well. But there are plenty of ways to meet in the middle. Um, and honestly, I think if we get off of social media and stop watching cable news um, and, <laughs> and think more calmly and more rationally uh, about what the future that we want to see for this country. Um, I think there's a way to really engage people in a in a in a more productive and healthy way, um, so that we all have a better future. I'm laughing because I think that's one of the reasons I could be calm about this since I stay off social media. So I. <laughs> Tim or John, did you want to say anything on this issue before we move to Q&A from the audience? Anything at all another organization can help with? 
I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I imagine that, uh, you know, avenue that, that farmers are going to work with uh, as far as programs and things to, to adopt a lot of these changes is, is probably going to be, you know, uh, the USDA or FSA and, and NRCS that sort of like, as you're saying, th those, those institutions are already there and those relationships with your local agents, uh, your county ag agents or your, your, your local uh, NRCS agent. I mean, they're already there and, and a lot of these things are already going through, but um, you know, FSA does a lot of farm loans and NRCS does a lot of, uh, you know, changes from, you know, things like drainage or, or equipment and, and storage facilities, but all those different things, you know, that's there. And I think if that focus uh, was turned directly toward, you know, reducing, uh, you know, either, you know, carbon sequestration or reducing carbon emissions on farms, um, I think it would be much, you know, more feasible and a quicker rollout than trying to start a whole new organization or, or new partnerships. You know, it's, it's really foundations there uh, and it just needs a, a directional turn a little bit, you know, to, to have a more climate focus. Anything to add, Tim, or would you like us to move to Q&A? I don't have anything of real substance to add to that. I think everyone else on the panel really covered it. Um, I mean, it's, it's trying to partner with, with us or the farm community, just realize that you know, it takes a conversation first before you want to enact some kind of policy. Um, and you really want to, because a lot of times coming from the environmental end, we like to enact policy without understanding how the end user is affected. And then that affects me because I get yelled at by a farmer because <laughs> I'm in the environmental world. Um, it, it's always good to just understand exactly that community you're working with. And, you know, when I partner with other organizations, it's good that we had that shared understanding that you know, we're trying to work with rather than create loggerheads there of working against that farm community. And we wanna bring those potentially innovative ideas out there that, that might go against conventional wisdom that we might already have, um, especially when it comes to climate resiliency and, and thinking of these things. I mean, in the environmental world, we love to build wetlands, but in the agricultural world, they need drainage and drainage provides resiliency. In those in that community so it really takes a shifting of perception on that of how do we you know allow to maintain this drainage by also but also achieving some of those those habitat outcomes at the end of these things so it's really looking at it comprehensively rather than staying within our silos and, and not and not thinking about the broader impacts it's hard for for folks like me and tim to walk that line because then you get shot by both sides you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. i think that was a really good point about not being siloed um so yeah chris do we have any uh q a's from the audience you'd like to bring up it's a direct yeah, we have a we have a decent bit now um i guess i would like to start off by trying to get your guys's thoughts on the viability for um getting, I guess, like a credit for um, carbon sequestration as opposed to yeah, sort of the opposite of a carbon tax, I, I guess would be the way to say it. Um, well, and, you know, maybe John wants to talk on his side too, but the, the challenges that I see are just the variability of soil. So, so let's say, you know, oftentimes when you talk to people, they say, well, you can, you can test your organic matter you can test your soil carbon. Well, we know, you know, I can, I can test a spot and then five feet away, have another test and come up with a different, a different result, even under the same field, same general soil structure, same general geological base material, but, and it's under the same management. And, and so the challenge is, let's say we do our tests and we get a, a four and a half percent organic matter and everybody's excited and we get, we get paid on that. And then the next year we do a test, but there's a drop of a half a percent or something like that. Well, I've had that happen to me, you know, and, and I didn't change anything I was doing. We did all the same things. The soil looks great. The animals are healthy. The environment looks wonderful. We don't have any runoff, but the test came back different. Well, now do I, do I lose money? Do I, do I have to pay something back? Am I penalized? And, you know, 
and and soil changes in different types times a year the respiration the activity with the microbes with the plants and so you know some of this goes back to science and and a lot of the science when you talk with them to the scientists they don't have an answer and so it's almost like the the, the population wants a, a hard fast rule but yet we're dealing with a, a not a not a not a defined thing oftentimes that we got to figure that out um so that that's my own personal challenges that i've seen yeah i mean i agree with keith that it, it would be a very hard measurable um thing as far as you know how much carbon you can sequester per acre and i guess it would have to be you know this many acres adopting a certain um policy or practice, you know, and, and however that's enacted that you could uh, count that as, as carbon sequestration. But I, I agree, it's, we're certainly in a field um, with a lot less measurable, uh, you know, results um, as far as how much carbon can be, be trapped in soil. But if, if the scientific community can come up with a, a pretty decent formula and what that would, you know, as a per acre and, and maybe even, you know, make it sort of across the country, although, you know, for sure, soil activity in a, in a dry part of the country is way lower than in a wet part of the country. And, the, you know, the, the turnover on the carbon is, is much slower. I still feel like, you know, it's it's maybe just as valuable for, for all farmers to start adopting some some of those changes. Um, and yeah, there would, um, you know, every 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 small farm and every large farm, it's its, its own business. So, it, you know, you, you got to put motivations in the right way. And I do think being um, you know, subsidizing carbon sequestration on farms is, is a very good way to, to get the ball rolling, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we tackled uh, a lot of soil erosion right after the, the dust bowl, right? We kind of came up with the, uh, what, what led to the NRCS we have today, and uh, we haven't had another dust bowl, so I think we can, uh, can wood. certainly, <laughs> yeah, knock on wood, right? But yeah. um, I think, you know, um, you know, farmers started better practices of following things. I mean, there's still a lot of cases of soil erosion, but um, yeah, I think it does take some somewhat of that uh, top-down motivation um, and, and, and subsidy, but you know, there's a lot of subsidies already being thrown around in the, in the agricultural world. And I think if you put some weight behind them in, in carbon sequestration, I think there could be uh, some results there relatively quickly, you know, at least I'm hopeful. Yeah. I agree with what, both John and Keith just said, um, you know, it's, I think there's, if there's is a viable option to put a monetary value on carbon sequestration within the farm sector, the agricultural sector. Um, and I know a, a one farmer that said to me, yeah, I'll do soil health, but you have to pay me. So they're open to these, these ideas of what it takes to do soil health, but there's also understanding and it's something that we understand very well in the state of Maryland because we have great scientists working on these questions that it's about a 10 year return on investment to that farmer if they're implementing these soil health practices. This is not a, a short term, you know, quick change in their practice and they're all, all of a sudden gonna grow, you know, 300 bushel yield or something. You know, it's gonna, it's what's gonna happen is they're gonna go from 200 bushel under their, what they're doing conventionally, they're gonna go down to 150 the next year it's gonna be a yield loss. We have to understand we're implementing practices that don't always have a positive, positive agronomic outcome. So if we want these things to happen, there needs to be some kind of monetary value to, to allow them to, to make it through those first 10 years. Um, so, you know, it, I'm kind of hopeful that we can do that and not only just for carbon, but nitrogen, phosphorus and sediment. Um, Cause it'd be great if a, if a farmer was able to say, you know, you know, I grow my commodity crops, but my other commodity is conservation. And they see that as part of their portfolio to sustain their operation for the long term. Um, I don't know if the markets are there yet. Uh, the, the first carbon trade, I think it was like $14 per ton of carbon, if I remember correctly, somewhere around there. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that within my ag committee, we have, you know, farmers on the board that have done a trade or have done part of that. So I know what they've been through. And, and they said it's definitely not, you know, enough to make it a large scale thing that they would do right now. Um, but obviously there's a huge push. And if you look at the Soil and Water Outcome Fund, which started in Iowa, their, their biggest source of, of outcomes right now is carbon. Um, so they're helping 
pay farmers to do no-till cover crappie in Iowa because they don't have a state-run program like in Maryland. So, and the understanding is that there's a contract involved with that too. I think it's like a, a five-year contract because soil health doesn't happen once a year. <laughs> soil health builds on itself. It's a decadal thing. So it's, that's the important part that we have to understand also. Yeah, we're just, you know, for the, for the folks out there that might not fully understand what we're talking about. So like in Maryland, we have our nutrient management program. So every three years we test our soil based on those tests. That's how you can apply nutrients. So the idea is you don't want to over apply. Then you can, you can attach a, a organic matter test with that. Sometimes depending on who you go to, it's included, but those tests cost about $18 and then you can go up from there. So there's some Haney tests and Cornell tests that you can do, which will measure microbial activity, but those get into the, to the higher ranges. There you might be $300 a test. And then one of the things that they don't analyze though is fungal activity. Well, your fungal activity is what's usually dealing with your carbon and your carbon sequestration. Well, then now you're talking exponentially up, up from that. Well, I have farmers that are neighbors that, you know, mo grow multiple crops or pick your own. They have 35 different soil tests they have to do in a year. And so they're not going to be able to afford 500, you know, $700 a test at the amount of tests they have to do. And so it, 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 it really, you know, how do you measure it? How do those things happen? So. Okay. Oh, really good points. Do we have another uh, question from the audience, Chris? Yeah, we actually, we have several. Um, so I guess the next question um, is a bit more kind of going back to bridging things together, but um, what do you feel is uh, missing when you're trying to connect with policymakers, uh, I guess, uh, people that aren't in your field? Well, I, I'll say, you know, farmers are less than a percent and a half of the population. So go into Baltimore, go into New York City and try and find people that know their farmers. You know, if you look in your refrigerator today, all the people that are on and try and do a guesstimate of how much of that is from a farmer that you knew or that you went to and got it. Most people don't have friends that are farmers or and, and so. I can completely understand why they wouldn't have any any way to to corroborate stories or to get the knowledge or to get the background or understand. Um, but but that's that's kind of some of the thing that's missing. If you don't have that relationship, you don't have that way to get a quick answer from somebody you know and trust. And and then 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 it becomes what you read on the internet or what somebody else told you or the book you read or the the news headline, and and then it becomes harder to have that that intelligent conversation regarding things that are real, you know, so. Drew, is there anything you wanted to add from the aquaculture side of things? Um, no, I mean, I, I'm trying to, you know, link this to our audience a little bit to help them understand. So, you know, the way Washington works and, and that's the world that I deal in, right? That in Washington and advocating on the Hill, um, you know, especially in the House of Representatives, members are really responsive to their constituents, but you really get people only on either end of the spectrum that are calling, right? So the people in the middle who feel passionately don't really get involved in politics. They think it's a black box. They don't understand it. They don't understand that that, that congressman works for them, right? It is their job to be responsive. And they do listen and they do track what's going on. And so it is really important to get more people mobilized and involved and telling those stories um, all right, because they don't know farmers, right? They might go to a farm here or there. They might go on a site visit or a tour. Um, but, but right, like Keith and John, if you can get your member of Congress out to your farm to understand this and, and other members within the CCL community can help make that link. So as solutions are being proposed, they can better understand this, right? A lot of staffers aren't technical, aren't scientific. They don't have a ton of scientists on the Hill. So we need more of that connection between the science, 
the farmers or the industry or the businesses that are being impacted and real citizens helping to make that connection with those members of Congress, right? So, so that is probably the most important thing we can do to help influence policy is get that real world um, information to the members of Congress. Otherwise, it's somebody sitting in a conservation organization who has come up with a solution, like, like Tim said, that doesn't always meet the real world. Um, and that's really missing in policy. And I think it's really important for those connections to be made. That's a really good point. Uh, do we have one last question from the audience, Chris? A lot, a lot of the questions are significantly more specific and focused directly at panelists. Um, I think those those were definitely more of the broader questions that we asked. Um, so <laughs> I can ask more. I can ask more specific questions if that's something that that uh, we could benefit from here. I'm here for you. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll start from the top. This one goes to Tim. Um, the question is, what sort of soil proposals did you find didn't work, just weren't feasible at all, and what about them made them not feasible? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have a good example really offhand. We're in the process of trying to understand this at a state level. Uh, I'm working with MDA to implement their demonstration soil health program. And through that, I'm realizing how tough it is to actually implement soil health at scale um, because of how these operations are set up. And it's it was kind of eye-opening because it's like we had incentives on top of incentives, like sign up to the cover crop program. We have additional incentive if you sign up to the soil health part of it also. But then you get the rubber hits the road and it's like, well, I'm doing corn this year, soybeans next year. Well, I can't do that then because I do it this way. That's going to affect this. Um, and it, it just became apparent that, you know, the initial thought of, hey, it's really easy to implement these practices across a broad scale of farms is not the reality. And it kind of made me understand that if we really want to make a large impact, you know, reach, obviously Keith and, and John are probably that that top 20%, they took risks, they're doing stuff that most farmers aren't doing. But as, as everyone knows, it's the next 60% that's gonna make the tremendous big difference in either water quality or climate change. And it's, it's trying to understand what are the practices and how do you implement them to fit their operations so it, it's actually feasible. And that's something that we're still trying to understand, I think, because it, it's, it's tougher than just, you know, throwing some cover crops on and, and walking away. I can, I can give an example of, of charcoal and biochar, you know, that, that hit fast and heavy, you know, the, the, the data is there that, that shows in these communities that, that have it around the world, that it, it, it does somehow their soil health there. But when you, when you have a bunch of YouTube videos and someone comes out and says, look at what I did, you know, you need to start doing it and it catches on. Well, there was a lag there. There, you know, then suddenly scientists start going, well, we need to research this. What is actually causing the benefits that people are seeing? And then, you know, some go to off, off to Brazil and try and research it in the Amazon and in the rainforest. And then there were no programs available for it. So then NRCS had to catch up and they had to get, you know, they put gasifier programs out. But the way they put the programs out didn't help. The farmers couldn't get the get the projects in to make the charcoal. And so, you know, it, 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 now there's some, some carbon soil amendment uh, uh, standards of practices within RCS that you can get, get accommodated for. And, you know, Tim works with a lot of the, 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 the irrigation ditches and, you know, you do the biofilters and the bioreactors and they found that, well, if you add the charcoal, it can improve what's stored beyond just wood chips and woody biomass. So it, it you know, there's, there's, there's kind of an ebb and flow and a catch up and a, and a, you know, but, but, but that's still a challenge with trying to get charcoal in the ground and get it made properly and appropriately and, you know, get the soil health benefit from it. That last question, I think we're actually just about out of time. Um, we've included links to our uh, teams or our panels uh, websites. If you'd like to check them out, uh, we want to thank our panels for joining us uh, and extend appreciation on behalf of CCL. Um, and we hope everyone checks out some of our future sessions. I apologize for any questions we didn't get to, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their Saturday.